Hey, this is Mark Wilson, and I'm here with my little red eastern screech owl, and we're celebrating Superb Owl Sunday, also spelled Super Bowl Sunday. And we're going to have some fun with owls here for the next uh, next half hour to an hour. And I'm going to introduce you to some of the owls that you might see right where you live, in your neighborhood, or uh, where you travel, if you're out camping or hiking. And uh, we're going to have some fun with owls. I've just done a book on owls. It's called Owling. And uh, a lot of the owls that you're going to see here today are also in the book. So check it out. It'll be available uh, in bookstores uh, second week of March, I'm told. Pretty proud of the book. All the photos are mine. I wrote it. But let's meet some owls here. Um, I should preface this with the fact that Marsha and my, my wife and I do live owl programs, and these owls are all non-releasable. They've been permanently injured in some way, and they can't survive on their own in the wild. And we give them a good home, and we have federal and state permits to use them as educational birds. And so we, we talk to thousands of people a year and show them who their neighbors are, their wild neighbors. So. Uh, this first owl we're looking at is the eastern screech owl. And here in Massachusetts, where I am, this is probably the most common owl. And yet 99% of the people of Massachusetts have never seen one. So it's a really hard owl to see. They're hiding during the day. They hide down in cavities and trees. And they come in two colors. I'm showing you the rusty brown one today. And uh, they also come in a bark colored gray which is very camo so in the woods it can be quite hard to spot but if you have any old trees in your neighborhood or yard check it out watch those cavities keep an eye on them and you might see an eastern screech owl peeking out at you now um i've photographed owls for over 30 years and often the hardest part about photographing an owl is finding it so there's a couple things you can do if you're looking for owls you can watch the ground and look for whitewash, which is a polite word for bird poop or owl poop. And also, after owls eat, 12 or 14 hours later, after they've eaten a mouse or other small creature, they'll cough up a pellet. And the pellet contains all the bones and fur from what they've eaten. So you can uh, take these pellets apart, and I'm sure some of you have done it maybe in, in school or camp. Um, and these pellets show you what they've eaten. You can key out the bones and the fur and the feathers and find out what they've eaten. But pellets and whitewash on the ground help you figure out where the owls might be roosting. And they're one of your clues in helping you find owls. Another thing to do when you're looking for owls is you can uh, listen for their calls. Because at night, that's the best time to hear an owl. Daytime is the best time to see one. Night is the best time to hear one. And the little call of the screech owl, it's a terrible name for this owl. They don't really screech. It's more of a horse whinny. And they go, <coughs> so they do that. And they also do this uh, little whistle that I can't do, but some of the hotshot birders can. Uh, it's like a little tremolo. And uh, it's quite useful to do that. And you'll to learn that call and you may uh, be hearing it around your house and not realizing that it was an owl. It's quite quite quiet and it's not uh, heard over long distances. So uh, don't be discouraged if you don't hear, it, hear one right away. I've lived here 35 years and I've only heard a screech owl at this house uh, twice. So if, if you're in their habitat, you'll hear them. If you're not, you won't. Um, now, let's see. I'm going to read a few questions here. Now that nesting season is going on, asks Allegra Boberman, are your owls demonstrating any of those behaviors? Well, it's a little early yet, although two weeks ago I was photographing a screech owl in New Hampshire, and lo and behold, the male copulated with the female. And I was like, what? That's way too early. They don't nest this early yet. Um, you might be hearing them, although this time of year they're a little quiet. Um, so screech owls tend to be more vocal in another month or two. Um, but they do nest in holes in trees. 
And if you don't have any of those, try putting up a birdhouse. And you can put up uh, one or two of those with a four-inch hole. And put one in your yard. You face it towards your house or apartment. And uh, if a screech owl moves in, you're going to have a front row seat to the, uh, to the nest. And you can see what's going on. Okay, Jeff Litchfield asks, what owls in New England migrate and which owls are territorial? Well, all owls can be territorial. Screech owls don't migrate, though, so that's a good question, Jeff. Um, screech owls are permanent residents. So if you, if you see a screech owl now, chances are it's going to be there during the nesting season. Um, so they don't migrate. They're, they live year-round in the same spot, and that makes it easy to uh, kind of keep tabs on them if you have one in your neighborhood or yard. This little screech owl is looking at the monitor watching her uh, image <laughs> on the computer. So that's what she's staring down at is her image saying, who's that screech owl down there? Uh, so um, we do have, uh, let me just see, we have 15 owls that we care for and uh, they all go out to programs. These little owls can live a long time. Uh, I think the oldest screech owl I know of is uh, almost 28 years old. It's 27 going on 28. And so generally the rule of thumb is the bigger an owl, the longer they live. But little screech owls can live in, you know, two decades plus, which is pretty amazing because big owls and hawks can eat them and catch them. So it's, uh, it's a dangerous world out there if you're a screech owl. But one other quick thing. Um, how do you tell if a bird is an owl? Well, there's three things that I look for. Number one, owls have really big heads and you'll notice that this owl's head is as wide as its body and that's not true for hawks falcons and eagles number two owls have eyes on the front of their head and you can see that really well with the screech owl they're forward-facing eyes just like you have and number three owls tend to stand upright most birds tend to stand horizontally you'll notice also that most birds um have eyes on the sides of their head. So three easy things to tell if a bird is an owl. All right. Faith Christensen McGinnis asks, we are concerned about owls we hear here in the California desert, maybe barn owls. They are very close by and only occasionally are they hearing them. Our concern is that our seven pound dog in the yard might be taken. Should we be concerned at night or also during the day? Um, well, Faith, if it is barn owls you're hearing, they won't take a seven pound dog because barn owls eat mostly um, rodents. However, if you're hearing great horned owl, which goes, ooh, 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 they can take a small dog or a cat. So if you're having uh, great horned owls, be careful. <coughs> Excuse me. I think I'm going to cough up a pellet here. <clears throat> All right, so I think I can need a cough drop. This is Facebook Live, and you get to see me choking here in my pellet. <clears throat> All right. That was a great question. Renda asks, Christensen asks, <clears throat> what owls are common in Northern Neck, Virginia area? <clears throat> and I would say that screech owl, great horned owl, and barred owl would be your most common owls in that area. <clears throat> that's true of most of the eastern part of the country. So those owls are pretty common and pretty widespread. <clears throat> Excuse me while I clear my throat. <clears throat> All right, those are great questions. So great horned owls are found in every state except... Um, except uh, Hawaii. So you can see them in all the states. <clears throat> all right. I think I'm going to swap out owls here. And I'm going to take, uh, hand this bird off to my wife, Marsha. <clears throat> and we're going to bring out another owl here in a moment. Okay. So I think the next owl we're going to look at is going to be a barred owl. And barred owls in, are increasing. They're extending their range here in the country. Um, 
um, just in the last 20 years <clears throat> here in Massachusetts, they've, um, they've uh, come on to Cape Cod. And that's something that 20, 25 years ago, they weren't nesting on Cape Cod, but now they are. And uh, so that's something new. <clears throat> and <coughs> sorry, I'm melting down here with my voice. Um, in the Pacific Northwest, where I'm, I know some of you are watching from, barred owls are now preying on uh, sp spotted owls, and it's making it difficult for spotted owls to survive. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> So I'm here with the female barred owl, <coughs> and um, the female barred owl is a beautiful bird. You can see she has dark eyes, rounded head, no ear tufts sticking up off of her head there. And we don't give our birds names. We use their scientific name. So this is Strix, the barred owl. And she is going to be 17 here in another month or two. Um, she is a great bird, great educational bird, very calm. Her story is that she was actually hit by a car in New Hampshire about 26 and a half years ago. And someone found her by the side of the road with a severely damaged wing. And they rescued her. They brought her to the wildlife clinic. And the doctors had to amputate this bird's right wing which means she obviously can't fly and she won't regrow the wings. So she does live outside with her boyfriend and he can't fly either. And they can live into their thirties or maybe even longer. We'll see. Check back with us in 20 years and see how long they've lived. Um, but she is a great calm bird, very common in the East. <coughs> Excuse me. You can see them down South. Uh, up through the northeast, all the way out to the west coast. And uh, this bird is just a wonderful education bird. You can see her flapping her wings there. All right. <clears throat> is there a way to attract owls to your area? Asked Sharon Parker. Well, <coughs> there is. There are several things you can do. <clears throat> Number one, put up a birdhouse for them. So a barred owl would be a big house with an eight or nine inch hole. And number two, try not to use pesticides in your yard uh, because if you're poisoning rodents, you're potentially also poisoning owls and hawks and coyotes and foxes and other animals that eat rodents. So keep an organic yard if you can. If you do need to trap a mouse or a rat, you know, don't use poisons. Use a snap trap, and that will kill it without poisoning other animals. You can live trap it, too, and release it at another place. But um, if you are going to trap it, try to uh, not, you know, not use some of the sticky traps or things like that. Use a snap trap. It would kill it right away. And, you know, keep some rough sections in your yard. It doesn't have to be finely manicured grass. And that way you can uh, encourage some rodents to be in the yard as food for owls. And if you have a bird feeder, a bird feeder will attract rodents on the ground. And barred owls often come in and hunt them um, under the bird feeder. And some of you are probably seeing that this winter, barred owls sitting near the bird feeder. Uh, let's see. <coughs> Terry, Terry Lynn... Jervis says she has uh, a pair visiting. They talk back and forth, and she loves them. And it's fun to hoot back to them. <coughs> Excuse me here. I'm going to really cough hard. Not in your ear. <coughs> Boy, you'd think I was allergic to owls or something. All right, that's a little better. Um, barred owls are noisy owls. So if you have them in the neighborhood, you're going to know it. Um, they sound like monkeys in the woods. Typically, their call is eight notes. It goes, woo, 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 
So that's eight notes. Who cooks for you? Who cooks for you all? And uh, if it's not the breeding season, try calling back to them. But during the nesting season, you may not want to try calling to them too much because you might stress them out a little bit. They might think there's an intruder in their breeding ground area. So it's best to hoot to them like late summer, early fall, not when they're nesting. Barred owl is one of my favorite owls. It's one of the first owls I ever remember hearing. <clears throat> I was camping um, up in the White Mountains of New Hampshire, and I think it was one of the first owls I ever heard was barred owls. And I didn't know what it was at the time. There's some great places you can go to hear owl calls. Um, there's some birding apps you can get on your phone, or you can go to Cornell University's website, and they have the Library of Natural Sounds, and you can listen to all the owl's calls on that, that site and figure out what you're hearing right around the house or neighborhood. Um, this owl um, weighs about two pounds. And you, when you see a pair of owls together, you'll notice usually one is larger than the other. And that means the larger one is usually the female. Uh, females are bigger, they're stronger, they're heavier than the males. So uh, the females are obviously the ones that lay the eggs. So they have to incubate them and they, protect the young so they're often evolutionarily it pays for them to be bigger and stronger than the male meanwhile the male drops off food and uh, the female will just wait for him and for him to bring in food to the nest barred owls are a cavity nester generally uh, which means they nest in holes in trees or broken off snags and um, here in the summer we have barred owls that come in and uh, will sit on the cages of our birds here uh, and she'll hoot to the wild birds, and uh, it gets quite noisy at night here. We may have five or six barred owls all hooting at once, so it's quite, quite a treat to hear. But if you're hearing owls, oftentimes it's the barred owl. They're quite noisy, and uh, they just make a, uh, a great racket. When is the nesting season for great horned owls, Jeff Litchfield asks. Um, well, they're the first bird to nest, first owl to nest in the U.S., so typically here in the east, they're laying their eggs sometime between December in the south up through February in New England. So right now we're approaching the egg laying season for great horned owls here in Massachusetts. Um, so they don't build their own nest. They use an old stick nest of another bird like a raven or a hawk or a crow. And um, typically great horned owls You'll hear them in courtship in December and January here in New England. And then in February, they lay their eggs. And they can, the female can get, you know, caught by a blizzard. And she might be sitting on eggs with a foot of snow on her back uh, during February. Because as, as you all know, snow can be quite heavy in February. And if these owls are nesting, they have to deal with that. They won't leave the nest. Otherwise, those eggs get spoiled. Um there's a link that was just published here uh, to the Library of Natural Sounds, um, so you can check that out to hear the voices of these birds. But you know, you don't need an app on your phone to hear the the calls. You can uh, you can easily listen to it and then imitate it by your by your mouth. And then the more you do it, the better you'll get. Sarah asks, which owls are most common in Massachusetts? Well, those would be the three that we're going to see here today. Um, Actually, I take that back. Two that we're going to see today, and then one that I'll mention. The first one is the screech owl, which we just met. And then the barred owl is, is very common throughout New England, particularly Massachusetts, New Hampshire, and Vermont. And then the third one is the great horned owl, which is really common and widespread, but not as common as the screech owl or the barred owl. So those are the big three, and all three of those are permanent residents. There are some migratory owls that come through that are can be fairly common, like northern sawwit owl. And that's a tiny little owl that migrates. Very hard to find, very hard to locate. There may be hundreds of them migrating through New England, but locating just one can be a real challenge. Um, one of the ways you can improve your odds of finding owls is to get yourself a good pair of binoculars um, because you really extend your your vision with binoculars. You, you see a lot more. If you haven't used binoculars, check it out. They're so useful in finding owls. And then 
uh, a good bird book will help or app on your phone. And uh, the other thing is when I'm photographing owls, I use a telephoto lens. You, your phone isn't the best tool to photograph an owl. So say you have one at your bird feeder, a phone might be useful, but I tend to use telephoto lenses like this. Uh, this is a 600 millimeter lens and it uh, helps me get a frame filling picture of the owl without getting too close to scare it or stress it. And that's the key. You don't want to get too close to owls because if they flush, they're burning up, you know, valuable energy. And the little owls, if they flush, they're exposing themselves to danger. So you don't want to get so close that you're that you're going to flush the owl. Snowy owls draw a lot of attention. And uh, with a snowy owl, I don't usually go closer than 150 or 200 feet. And that way the bird feels secure and doesn't usually fly. Barred owls, same, 150, 200 feet. A screech owl sometimes will sit in their hole and you can get, you know, 60 or 70 feet and they don't seem to be too stressed. So it's it's learning to read their behavior, their body language, and uh, if you see the owl flush, it probably means you were too close. So with practice, you'll get better at observing them without flushing them. Okay, where do you look for owls? Anywhere there's trees here in the east. And out west, you know, you can see great horned owls up on cliff faces and caves. Um, but anywhere there's trees are good places to look for owls. There's a lot of uh, birders networks, listservs there now that can tell you, help you find out where to go. Also, eBird, which is Cornell's uh, bird sighting uh, website, eBird is a place where you can go and learn about other people's sightings. And during the nesting season, you won't find many sightings listed about nests because it's it's not really kosher to list a nest online. Um, you don't want to advertise where a bird's nesting. But once the season is done, you can often pick up owl sightings on eBird and it'll point you to areas to look. Here in the Northeast, um, some of the National Wildlife Refuges can be quite good for snowy owls and barred owls and short-eared owls. Actually, any of the refuges all over the country can be quite excellent. So National Wildlife Refuges are great places to check as our sanctuaries that various conservation groups will run. Uh, Rebecca asks, whoa, that's a big lens. Which weighs more, the lens or the owl? The, the lens weighs more by far. The lens weighs 11 pounds, the owl weighs two pounds, even though the owl looks like it could weigh 11 pounds, right? Um, so yeah, I lug that thing around a lot, and it's uh, I've got grooves in my shoulder from the tripod lugging that big lens. Uh, but it's it's what I do to get quality pictures, um, and uh, the technology keeps changing and getting better. So those of you that are contemplating digital photography with wildlife and birds in particular, some of the new lenses that are coming out are so lightweight and amazing. Um, they allow you to you know good mobility. You're not gonna break your back trying to carry them through the woods and uh, so a 600 millimeter lens is pretty good focal length for photographing wary wildlife and some of these new zoom lenses like a 150 to 600 are, are quite popular with people photographing birds all right so when is the nesting season for barred owls Sarah asks um, here in New England the nesting season would be probably March, they lay their eggs. In, in the south, uh, like in Florida, Georgia, down that way, it would be earlier. Uh, out west, out in the Pacific Northwest, it's probably March or April that they would lay eggs. Um, but, you know, they eat a lot of different things. They're very adaptable. They eat earthworms, they eat fish, they eat frogs, salamanders, chipmunks, mice, flying squirrels. Uh, but they won't take your cat or dog. Uh, a great horned owl would, but barred owls are pretty good in that they won't uh, take your cat or dog. Uh, but you will see them hanging around a bird feeder, and typically they're looking for mice or voles that are attracted to the bird seed on the ground. Um, they won't take a skunk, but a great horned owl will take a skunk. All right, I'm just going to cruise through the questions here. Uh, 
Let's see here. I think I've answered most of them. What owls have you photographed out in the wild this winter so far, Allegra asks. Well, I've been working on getting the book done, so I haven't been out shooting as much this winter as usual, but this is not a big year for snowy owls here in New England. There are a few around, but I haven't really uh, spent the time working them. Uh, I have photographed several screech owls. They're very dependable. Once you find a hole that they're using, uh, I tend to repeat, go back many times to get different behaviors. And uh, screech owls are a lot of fun to shoot. I usually shoot late in the day on screech owls, and that way I can get their eyes open. Because if you see one during the day, his eyes are usually clamped shut, and it doesn't make the most uh, effective picture. But uh, if you go out uh, late in the afternoon or early evening, they usually start to come alive, and their eyes are open, and you get a much more effective picture if the owl's eyes are open. Will they take rabbits, asks Terry Lynn. Uh, yes, they will take small rabbits. Um, I don't think they would take a, a, a snowshoe hare necessarily, unless it was a young one. But they will take rabbits for sure. Uh, snakes. Uh, and some owls eat fish, which is surprising. You know, screech owls, great horned owls, and barred owls have all been known to take fish. And that means if you take apart a pellet after they've eaten a fish, you're going to find fish scales in that pellet, which how cool is that? Bardell's listening to me tell this story, right? She's looking and saying, really? I eat fish? We just give them mice. We feed our birds farm-raised mice. We buy them frozen. They come to us shipped frozen. And uh, good food's expensive. We spend about $1,000 a month on mice feeding these birds. But you got to feed them the right diet to keep them healthy. And uh, they never seem to get tired of mice, which is a good thing because that's what they get. Um uh, just scanning through faith christensen mcginnis asks do they hunt only at night actually no it's a great question when they have kids in the nest uh they often will hunt during the day so feeding four or five chicks can be a lot of work and uh i have often seen barred owls out hunting in daylight as i have great horned owls so even though owls are generally nocturnal when they have kids in the nest, they're usually going to be hunting uh, into the daylight hours. And, of course, in the Arctic, in the summer, snowy owls have to hunt in daylight because there is no night. It's 24-hour sunlight in the Arctic where they nest. So owls can be diurnal. They can be nocturnal. And they can switch back and forth. So they're very adaptable that way, which is pretty cool. Um, all right. I think we're going to try for another owl here. So I'm going to hand this bird back to Marsha. And okay. So this next owl, oop, still attached there. Okay, this next owl is not native to uh, New England, not native to North America actually. It's going to be a Eurasian eagle owl. So it's native to Europe and Asia, and it's tied to be the biggest owl in the world if you go by weight or body length. Um, they're quite large. We have a male here who uh, Marshall will bring in shortly. He was captive hatched in the United States at a zoo, um, so he's imprinted on people, and that means that he either thinks we're owls or he's a person or something in between, but the eagle owl is uh, an impressive bird, no matter how you cut it. Big feet, big body. They can take large prey. They can knock down a fawn or a badger or a big snake. And uh, this eagle owl that you're about to meet is almost 17 years old. And the record for eagle owls in captivity for age, I think the oldest one that I know of is 61 years old that was in a zoo in Germany. So they can live a long time. And if he goes to 60, he'll probably outlive me. Uh, I can hear him hooting. Marsha's coming in with him here. And, uh, okay, step up while he's hooting. I'm going to back up here so we can see his full magnificence. And so this is a Eurasian eagle owl, and he is a male. So he weighs in at four and a half pounds. 
And yes, there is an owl that says who, and you're looking at him. He goes, who? See if I get him to hoot here. Who? You hoot? Who? There we go. For some reason, when I roll my hand, he hoots. Um, it's un unknown why he does that. You'll notice, for those of you that have seen great horned owls in this country, you'll notice he looks very similar. Great horned owls have yellow and black eyes. The Eurasian eagle owl has orange and black eyes. So he's also bigger and the coloration is slightly different. But this is not an owl you're going to see flying around in North America. So you'll have to take a road trip or a plane trip to uh, Europe. They're found as west, as far west as Spain, as far north as Finland and Russia, and then over to Japan, China, India. Big range, two continents. There's many species of eagle owls, but this is the one of the north. And uh, just an impressive bird. Uh, he is quite calm because he is imprinted on people. And, you know, by law, you can't release imprinted birds back to the wild. And also, this is an exotic species, so he would not be released into the wild in this country. But check out these feet. I'm going to do a close-up of his feet. You can see his monster talons there. These big owls can squeeze stronger than a human. A strong person that has trained can squeeze with about 140 pounds pressure per square inch. This big owl can squeeze with more than 300 pounds pressure per square inch, maybe as much as four or 500 pounds pressure. So they grab their prey with their feet, not with their beak. And that's how they hunt. And then they often will use their beak to uh, rip the prey apart, but they catch it with their feet. And their feet are very important to them, so they keep them clean. The talons are very sharp. That's why I'm wearing a glove. If I didn't have this glove on, I'd be bleeding right now on camera. And uh, he's he's not crushing my hand, but he is gripping it quite strongly, um, just so he steadies himself. You'll notice that um, he's got these leather straps around his leg. These are called jesses, and this is how I keep him on the hand. Um, he can fly. He has a big outdoor aviary. He can get exercise there. He can sit in the sun. He can sit in the rain. So he, he lives a good life. Um, sometimes chipmunks get into his uh, cage, and they don't come out. So, uh, Sarah asks, can they see well during the day? The answer is yes. I'll see probably as well as we do during the day. Uh, the only difference might be that they don't see color as well as we do. So. They've traded off some color vision for some low light vision. And at night, they can see detail certainly better than we do. But think about it. You know, color vision at night isn't that useful. All right, Faith McGinnis, uh, he told me, yes, great horned owls do during the day, too, if nesting. Yes. All right. What does it mean that he's imprinted on people, Sarah asks? Well, um, it means he was raised by people during that short period of time when he was a chick. It's about two or three week period when he can't fly. That if he's exposed to people rather than his own parents, he will imprint on the people as his caregivers. That means he looks at the world differently. He doesn't view people like a wild bird would view people. A wild bird would probably be afraid of people. Uh, whereas an imprinted bird views people as their own kind. And uh, I always like to say he either thinks that we're owls or he's a person. That's kind of what imprinting is. Uh, but he definitely identifies with people. He, he loves little kids. He loves people that visit. And you can see he's uh, quite calm on the hand. He is a beauty. Barbara Thompson comments there. Uh, and he is very, very beautiful owl. Uh, he's got a, almost about a four and a half foot wingspan. So I'll see if I can put his wings out for you here. You can see him. There we go. You can feel the wind from those wings too. And he is noticing his image in the camera here on the computer screen, but um, he doesn't seem to really know that it's him. So he's kind of unconcerned. But this eagle owl... Uh, can be found in cities. They're not just a wilderness bird. So I'm told that one time there was a uh, a big soccer match in Helsinki, Finland going on. 
the nationally televised soccer match, and a big eagle owl landed midfield in the soccer match, and none of the referees wanted to uh, were brave enough to go move the owl off the field, so it held up the game for five or ten minutes uh, on national TV. But there are, I'm told there are several pairs that nest in, in the city in Helsinki, Finland, and so they can be an urban owl too. As long as there's trees or cliffs or buildings, sometimes some owls nest on buildings. Um, yeah. Sarah asks, is he affectionate? Well, he can be once he gets to know you. Um, every night when I go into his aviary, he goes, ooh, 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 ooh. Ooh, ooh, ooh. That's kind of his friendly call saying, hi, are you interested? So you'll know what that means. I know this is probably a mixed age audience. We won't go any farther than that. But he does uh, show romantic tendencies to humans. And once he got to know you, too, he would be affectionate. Man or woman. He doesn't discriminate. So it's quite interesting seeing his behaviors. Last night I went into his aviary. And he was down in his nest. He has a little scrape in the ground. And he was trying to get me interested in his nest because he wants me to be his mate. So um, I showed some interest and then handed him a nice big fat mouse. And he seemed pretty happy about that. Now, of course, owls don't eat vegetables. So I can't, you know, you're never going to meet a vegetarian owl. You can't feed them uh, fruit or vegetables. They wouldn't be eating them. And they are carnivores, so uh, that's strictly what they eat. All right. Kimberly says, coming to you from Little Rhodey. I assume that's Rhode Island. And, uh, yes, you have lots of owls in Rhode Island. Uh, some great refuges down there to check for sawwet owls and snowy owls and other birds that might be migrating through. Uh, this owl will probably outlive me. Um, we adopted him when he was only, let's see, how old was he? I think he was about three or four weeks old when we adopted him. He couldn't fly yet. So we had him in a playpen in the kitchen, and he was exercising his wings every day. And uh, one day he lifted off up out of the playpen and landed up on the kitchen counter. And that was the time that he went outside into his big flight aviary. And uh, he gets lots of perches in there, and he can take baths and sit in the sun and eat snow if he in the winter if he's thirsty um, so he's he's quite a guy the lifespan for this owl is long he could go into his 60s so the rule of thumb is the bigger an owl the longer they potentially might live so little owls don't live as long big owls live longer of course big owls are at the top of the food chain they're apex predators Although another owl could kill a big owl. Sometimes uh, big owls kill other big owls. But generally, they're the top of the food chain. And uh, they can live a long time. All right. I'm just checking here to see if there's any other questions. And Jeff asks, do they strictly only eat live prey or will they forage for dead animals? That's a great question. Uh, they will sometimes eat things that are already killed. So some of you that live in New England this winter may be seeing barred owls uh, along the roads, and some of those might be foraging on roadkill. Unfortunately, if you're going to be foraging for roadkill, that means you're exposed to traffic, and you might be getting hit by cars. So a lot of barred owls end up in car strike situations. You may find an injured barred owl, and if you do, bring it to a wildlife rehabber or wildlife clinic, and uh, they maybe can save it. But this winter... There's been lots of reports in New England of barn owls uh, hit on the road, many of them dead. Uh, they're not a migratory owl, but they do move locally when we get these uh, severe winters uh, with deep cold and deep snow. Um, so, yeah, uh, they will occasionally take dead food. Of course, owls will cache food and go back and finish it off another day. So, you know, a snowy owl might catch a duck, eat part of it, and then cache it, and then the next day go back and finish the duck. One of my favorite stories about caching food, there was a barred owl in Boston who was living in the Christmas tree at Faneuil Hall. And at about 5 o'clock every night, the barred owl would come alive, come awake, and he would hop up into the Christmas tree to the top where he had cached 
a pigeon and he would proceed to tear the pigeon apart and all these shoppers and commuters would be down there at the base of the Christmas tree staring upwards as this barn owl just shredded this pigeon and people were either horrified or totally into it watching this happen but right in the middle of the city and that barn owl was in that tree at least for a couple weeks and uh I guess the pigeons and the rats at Faneuil Hall were supplying with plenty of food. Okay, Jason says, I could hire him to take care of our mole invasion. Okay, well, I don't know how far away you are, Jason, but we'll, we'll, we'll talk. Uh, Brenda asks, how many litters can each female have during her lifetime? Uh, well, let's see. They'd have one a year, and a female, if she lives to be 60, could have 60 clutches of eggs and they typically eagle owls typically have one or two uh chicks so they don't have too many like barn owls or snowy owls which can have a lot more kimberly asks do owls mate for life and the answer is some do but it depends on the species we're talking so here's how the, it generally works it's thought that migratory owls like snowy owls and sawwood owls may have a new mate every year and then the Permanent resident owls like eagle owls, great horned owls, barred owls, screech owls probably have long term mates, not a new mate every year. So then the question would become which, if you were an owl, which would you rather be? Would you like to be a migratory owl or a permanent resident owl? Don't have to answer that in public, but it's something to think about. Um, so this owl, you might notice from the side, Get him close to the camera here. His eyes are bigger than human eyes, but you'll notice that he can't move his eyes. His eyes are fixed in his head. So to look left and right, he has to turn his whole head. Ooh. And he can turn his head more than 180 degrees in each direction. And here he is looking almost straight over his back. Get him to look, look here without getting bitten. Um, so... They have extra neck bones, more than we do. We have seven. They have 14 neck bones. They can turn their heads about 220 degrees, a little less than three quarters of a circle in each direction. And they can do it very quickly, very strong neck muscles. It whips around, and they, uh, they really are an impressive bird, totally adapted for the hunting lifestyle. Allegra asks, how do the parents fare when feeding their young? Do they eat as often as the babies do, or is there priority feeding the babies? I keep reading about how some animals eat next to nothing when caring for their young. Well, I think owls do okay. The parents uh, do occasionally eat part of the prey before they bring it in. And I have seen half-eaten things come in to be fed to the babies. I'm assuming the parent ate the other half. Uh, they got to keep their strength up because it takes a lot of energy to fly and hunt. And so they do take prey. Um, I don't think they go hungry. It's more of a stress in the winter, I think, when there's deep snow, crusty snow, they may have trouble hunting. So it's, uh, it's one of those situations where the environment can offer the stress, not so much the babies. But they do stay busy. Uh, they do stay busy. Okay, well, I think we're going to wrap it up here. I want to thank you for joining me on Superb Owl Sunday. And if you were looking for a good book on owls, it's aimed at kids, but kids of all ages. And so I'm happy to report this book will be in bookstores uh, in two, about two weeks, uh, sorry, middle of March. And you can order it uh, online. Story has a uh, can link you to uh, places to get it, but check your local bookstores, support your independence, or you can get it from the big uh, book retailers as well. Uh, this book covers all 19 species of owls in North America, as well as some people, uh, I tell their stories of people that work with owls, an artist, an educator, a rehabber, some researchers, I tell their stories as well. So it's, a, it's an important way to, for kids to see how different people work with wildlife and uh, I think it makes for an interesting read. So thanks for your time uh, coming out on Super Bowl Sunday to see superb owls. Thanks so much.